Hi, I'm Don Moores, and welcome to Montgomery Week in Review. A meeting about redistricting reform in Maryland will be held at the University of Maryland College Park to discuss various ways to deal with these serious issues that seem to continue to plague our state with redistricting. Nancy Soren from the League of Women Voters of Maryland is here to explain. Last week's or this week's election had many surprises for people throughout the state of Maryland. Council member Phil Andrews is in the house. He's got some thoughts about the election and more. The election of Board of Education members is a very important decision every two years, although many citizens don't seem to care as much as they should about these candidates. Jane DeWinter, who comments on a regular basis for this program, has the story and more. There'll be changes in Social Security, as well as we're currently in the open enrollment season for Medicare as we look ahead to the end of 2014, the beginning of 2015. Stuart Rosenthal, editor and publisher of the Beacon newspaper, has these stories, as well as others about our finances, and if we have some time, about some exciting travel news as well. Nancy Soaring, welcome back. Thanks, good to be here. We have talked about redistricting. Right. That is a huge issue for the league at the state level. I know at the different county levels as right. well. Right. You had that, uh, you had the, 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 the state, the, 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 the gerrymander, gerrymander meander. meander. How'd that right. go? It went great. It, uh, the runners completed all 225 miles. The boaters did their paddling and the bikers did their biking. And we had a wonderful uh, press event at the Capitol to, to conclude the whole, whole thing. Can you tell us so, more about what it was? Well, yeah. this is what I, I talked about this on the show last right. time. The whole idea was to draw attention to the terribly gerrymandered third congressional district because we realized that the only way that we're going to change the redistricting process is to have the people demand the change. The legislators aren't going to do it on them all. So another thing we did to try and draw attention to redistricting reform. Yes, I saw this earlier. Why don't was, you put it between the two of you there? Yep. Okay. Was yeah. we had a contest where we asked uh, high school or college students to submit political cartoons that demonstrated the uh, problems with redistricting in our state, and this was the winning cartoon, and we were very pleased with it. Well, it, so. it's amazing how the Maryland flag and all the scraggliness, the way it's in, that is the, the congressional district, it, isn't it? Yeah, it's in there. It's in there. It's a, it's, it's a crazy district. So we did the gerrymander meander to draw attention to it. Right. We did the part cartoon contest. We've also thrown birthday parties for um, Mr. Gary in, 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 in Massachusetts way back when. Mm -hmm. but yeah, he, yeah. He'd be embarrassed his, by this yeah. one. His but district was so much more compact it was. than, than yeah. Mr. Sarsen's right. district. This far is worse. the closest right. thing in the country, isn't so it? So let me go on to what we're doing now. What are you doing so next? now we've been talking about the problem, trying yeah. to get people aware of the problem. We're going to have a panel discussion, a forum at the University of Maryland College Park okay. on next Monday night. If you'd like to go, just go to our website, lwvmd.org, and all the details are there, and there's a link to where you can sign up because we're trying to keep track. We don't want to have more people than the room will hold. Right. Um, and we're going to have uh, Delegate Brave Boy, who's been one of our champions in the legislator right. the legislature, mm -hmm. talk about some of the uh, problems with the way they do it in Maryland right, right now, some of the things, that, r lawsuits that have resulted from that. Okay. And then... Um, Congressman John Delaney has some federal legislation to address uh, redistricting forum on the national level, so he's mm -hmm. going to talk about that. Do you find that more people are concerned about you know something that's just so gerrymandered because of the effect that it could have on an election where you're handpicking certain districts, as opposed to the fact that when you have a district like that, how can you do constituent service? How can you have effective representation for the people in the I district? I think that's one of the points that we're going to try and make with our legislators, is that if you want to have good constituent services, good representation, a district that's drawn like the 3rd Congressional District just isn't going to allow that opportunity. So it's about good government, not just partisan politics. Mm -hmm. But then I, I want to tell you what our third uh, panelist is from the national. He's a, from the National Office of Common Cause, and he's right. going to talk about some of the different ways they do redistricting in other states in the nation. Let's, so let's, uh, if you could bottom line it, because sure. I mean this is important. This panel bringing this up, and 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 you've been doing a number of events to try to raise this in the conscience. Right. And I think Jane raises some good points in terms of, you know, it's the electeds who are going to have to make the decision unless right. the people seize it with a referendum or something like that. What has happened? and other states that have faced similar, like, I mean, grossness is really the only word I can think of it, to be able to take back control so that we have nonpartisan or less partisan drawing of districts. Well, the states that have those less partisan systems, for the most part, the people can put it on the ballot through referendum. We can't do that here Why in Maryland. Why can't we? 
because it's not in our Constitution to allow us to do that. The only time a question can go before the people is either if it's a constitutional amendment that right. was passed by the General Assembly, or if the General Assembly passes a law that the people don't like and they get enough petition signatures to, re to try to repeal the that referendum. law. Yeah, the referendum. We but can't get a constitutional amendment to change the constitutional amendment? Well, you know, that's, that would open another whole can of worms. You look at the states like Oregon and California that have many, many questions on their ballot. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's always a good thing either, but I don't, I'm not, I don't have a position on that particularly. I do have a position on redistricting reform, and I think we need to do something in the state, and I think we might have an opportunity as people become more aware. That's so important because this is one of the reasons why we have a dysfunctional Congress, a House of Representatives, right. where only about 10 percent of all of the congressional districts are competitive in the general election right. because the districts are drawn to be one-sided for one party or the other. Mm -hmm. So the action is in the primaries, and then candidates running those primaries cater to the most ideological members of their parties. So as long and as they I get their base out, they win. That's I right. will mention Phil's been one of our big champ champions, and mm -hmm. he did also participate in the gerrymander meander by running the last leg of it. Confident, Nancy, that we're going to see some change uh, in this? I'm, I'm hopeful. You know, during the uh, debate on MPT, both gubernatorial candidates said that they would support a nonpartisan uh, redistricting commission, so we'll see where we mm. can go. Mm -hmm. So have there been any examples of anyone who changed it, any state that, you know, went back and fixed something without vote a referendum or without, you know, having a legal, you know, be a legal legally challenge? Yeah. We have less than 30 seconds. Yeah. I, seconds. I, we'll find out at our forum on Monday. Okay. <laughs> um, well, that was too quick. We got another <laughs> 15 seconds. Any well, final words? Any fi final thoughts? Well, that's, that's, we've that the forum is going to talk about right. some potential remedies and mm -hmm. how how the states got there. And John yeah. Delaney deserves a lot of credit for taking this on in Congress. Yeah. Sure, he's really spoken out on it. And he's lucky he made it back to Congress. Yeah. This is a great segue, <laughs> Phil Andrews. <laughs> So that was the biggest surprise in the state of Maryland, right? That John Delaney nearly lost. Well, two big surprises. One There's was another surprise besides John Delaney almost <laughs> yes, losing. Yes, certain in governor's combat. race, but but John Delaney almost lost. That's right. He was behind most of the night until some of the Montgomery County precincts came in. He ended up winning by one point, 49-48 over um, John Bongino. Yeah. And uh, John Delaney. John Bongino, Dan Bongino. Right. <laughs> right. It was right. a uh, yes, right. Dan but very Bongino. much from the western part of Maryland yeah. uh, coming in strong, and then and. It, and yeah. that same western part of the Maryland, of Maryland, the shore, and other parts came in strong for another state. They sure for did. A statewide right. So uh, the other major surprise of the night was the decisive victory wow. by uh, Larry Hogan over Anthony Brown. And uh, Larry Hogan ran extremely strongly uh, outside the urban areas, uh, uh, in a lot of the suburbs, and in all the rural areas. He cleaned up. Uh, and the turnout was less than 2010. It was down about 10%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But Hogan certainly got a fair number of Democratic votes in places like Baltimore County, where he uh, ran as well as Anthony Brown ran in Montgomery County. Sort of like the Bob Ehrlich, these 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 working class Democrats that Ehrlich talked about when yeah. he when he. Uh, it was, off. I think, a third. Yeah, I think it was uh, a referendum really on on Martin O'Malley as much as anything else, and. Uh, on the whole, people decided they didn't want a third O'Malley term. Before we end I'm this thing, I want to make sure before the end we, we get back to Martin O'Malley presidential timber and mm -hmm. how this might affect that. But let's keep talking. I just wanted to point out that uh, Larry Hogan used public campaign finance money mm -hmm. and he was outspent by somebody else. Mm -hmm. So that gives hope for another one of the league's causes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's true. He did take it. Mm -hmm. uh, so did Heather Missouri in the mm -hmm. primary on the Democratic side. Yeah. So hopefully that will, that's a trend I hope. That and she continue. was a huge surprise in her numbers. We already talked about mm -hmm. that, but she did much better than anybody given her that's right you know, that's right yeah. Yeah. well and I think that it's it's not quite right to say that okay the Democrats who voted for um, Larry Hogan were you know the blue collar or the working man because well that could have been in Montgomery County but Montgomery County even though Anthony Brown carried Montgomery County it was by a much smaller margin than other statewide Democratic candidates like um, Brian Frosch and Peter Franchot carried Montgomery County, so Wait. it definitely was drop off that that not as many mm -hmm. uh, people voted for. So it wasn't as right. eerily similar to the last Democratic uh, incumbent lieutenant governor running, because um, again Montgomery County didn't come out as strongly for mm -hmm. for her. She needed Montgomery County coming out big time. Glenn There's Denning, some O'Malley similarities. That, yeah. Neither campaign was a good campaign. Uh, there was this was more of a uh, of a situation though I think where there's a very clear message by the Republican candidate mm -hmm. uh, about uh, taxes and the economy that people responded to uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say he does have a mandate. 
And but I think it was a national message, Yeah, that's what too. I was going to say. Yes. I think mm -hmm. I've heard people talk about the wave election, because when you look at, say, early voting returns, Anthony Brown did much better in, you know, mm -hmm. his margin in Montgomery County was much larger than it was. Um, on an election day, actually, he lost the election day vote. And I think that part of it is just kind of what was going across the country. So yes, mm -hmm. some of it could be internally Maryland and Martin O'Malley and, and you know not having a clear message, but some of it is just as the momentum builds. And I think that there's a point where maybe Democrats think, okay, we're gonna lose the Senate, so let me go ahead and have my vote send a message that mm -hmm. I'm ticked off or I'm. But one mm -hmm. of the stories is the declining turnout. Uh, it, it did go down again. Mm -hmm. The turnout in the primary was terrible. And I think that's the one of the larger issues that came out of this election years. There do need to be things done, like gerrymandering reform, right. like going to open primaries where everybody can right. vote, to get independents involved mm -hmm. and, and members of both parties early on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is part of what's going on here. You'll be leaving off. Are you ready to put your Common Cause hat back on as you used to be the head of Common Cause here? Are you well, I'm going to keep working on the issues yeah. that uh, the Common Cause has worked on, like gerrymandering reform, public finance. Sir, I want to step on you. Do you want to, step, you want to jump in? I was going to say that uh, the older voters in Maryland also probably might have been a factor here because I don't think the O'Malley administration paid a lot of attention to older voters. It was never one of their priorities, mm -hmm. and I think Brown was tarred, uh, tarred with that. And I think a lot of seniors, including mm -hmm. at Leisure World, I'm told, mm -hmm. uh, were surprisingly leaning towards mm -hmm. uh, Larry Hogan. This time. And in terms of the demographic who voted, it was much more skewed towards seniors. Of a lot fewer younger people. Yeah, they you vote. Know, Seniors go out to Right, vote, but I mean, in compared mm -hmm. to the previous right. two elections. That's right. Um, what do you think? I mean, we've Kathleen Kennedy Townsend was going to be the first woman mm -hmm. governor. Uh, Anthony Brown was going to be the first African American as governor. We haven't had an African American as a statewide senator, mm -hmm. as a governor, only a one lieutenant governor for one term. Right. Another, we, well, we have uh, no, we one have more. One. The, Afri uh, the new lieutenant governor. New uh, lieutenant governor, yeah, so lieutenant, yeah, but not yeah. the governor and not mm -hmm. right, U.S. senator. Not yet. It's, it's a shame. No women. No African American, no minority. I mean, doesn't this isn't this a black oh, Barbara market? Mikulski has gotten elected well, I'm a sorry, lot. Barbara so, I'm not, not the yeah. governor. So she was not first. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, about so Maryland Mikulski. has been very supportive yeah. of female candidates over the years. How do I forget Barbara Mikulski? Uh, we <laughs> once had a delegation, congressional delegation, that was half and half. We did. We did. Uh, go back to Martin O'Malley. Uh, he's he seems to have groomed himself. He's all but declared that he wants to be president of the United States. Uh, how does this uh, go before well, election? Well, uh, it doesn't help. <laughs> uh, because his uh, hand-picked successor was rejected, and a lot of the policies that uh, were at stake in the election were ones that uh, uh, Governor O'Malley had pushed. So it, it hurts his chances. Okay, well, that's the last word in the first half of our show. We'll be right back for the second half after these messages. Bring out the action hero in you. And we're back. Jane Winter, welcome back. Thank you. It is always delightful when you're on the show. Well, thank you. And we talk about education most of the time, mm -hmm. with you, even though as a PhD economist, we could talk about so much more, but we've got you pigeonholed in education because you're an I'll educator. take it. So the, the Board of Election, I mean, Board education. of Education, not Board of Election, Board of <laughs> Education, uh, we had four, uh, races four races on the ballot yeah. that we all voted for. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, there were three incumbents running, and they were all returned to office, although with varying degrees of varying Can margins. Can you re remind us of who they are? Yes, uh, Pat O'Neill, who represents District 1, which is Bethesda. Mm -hmm. um, and, and But you're right that everybody across the county right. votes for all, mm -hmm. for all every board but of education. She's one of the stalwarts on the board. Right. She's been there this for many, many years. This was her fifth term, yeah. fifth mm -hmm. election, and so wow. she was returned um, rather handily mm -hmm. over um, uh, PTA yep. activist from Potomac, okay. and then there was um, Mike Durso, mm -hmm. who uh, is sort of, I don't even know what you call it, up county, west, mm -hmm. east county. Mm -hmm. um, he was returned also, he was running against another PTA activist, okay. and Judy Daca was returned, although with a smaller margin. Uh, her challenger was the immediate past president of the countywide PTA, so it has some name recognition. So mm -hmm. before we get to the, the fourth race, which was the Confederate mm -hmm. race, it sounds to me like it's uh, almost like the, the, the status quo, if we want to go status quo, versus mm -hmm. the PTA, because often we get out of the PTA is it's sort of an insurgency. Mm -hmm. in these well, yes and things. no. I mean, Pat O'Neill came out of yeah. the PTA. Chris Barkley, who's right. on the board, who wasn't whose seat wasn't up this time, came out of the PTA. So. Um, 
you know, most and people. Shirley Brandman, right, and Shirley Brandman mm -hmm. also came out but, of PTA. But I find so. as well. Right. But Rebecca. I find that when we come out, I mean, sometimes coming through, I didn't see too much from the from the teachers union involvement mm -hmm. uh, openly. Right. But but the candidates that you mentioned who successfully came to PTA have worked very closely with the teachers union. Right. Others have come out and and you know, a pox. It's it's the parents. You know, mm -hmm. we need to have control. So. I don't know. So, so we have the three who were reelected. Right. The fourth. What was the, the fourth the seat one? was the at-large seat, mm -hmm. and that was actually an open seat because Shirley Brandman was not running for re-election, and so that was Shebra Evans, who was the on the Apple ballot, endorsed by the teachers union, uh, and Jill Ortman Faust, who's also both of them right. a PTA activists, and Jill won by a fairly small margin. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 51 to 48 percent. Um, I think they're both. They're both good candidates, mm -hmm. so either of them would do an excellent job. Um, but that was that again was um, you know not carrying the apple ballot. The apple ballot hasn't had that much. So what impact. do you think gave Jill the edge? Um, Jill had been a real activist in uh, in downtown Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, mm -hmm. and had a lot of connections. She had a lot of endorsements early on mm -hmm. from delegates and mm -hmm. other elected officials. I think that. Washington Post thing. endorsed her. Right, the well. Washington mm -hmm. Post endorsed her. And so um, I think that you also saw in a lot of races, even delegate races, that um, I don't think the Post endorsement flipped anything, but when the Post didn't endorse a Democrat, I think their margin tended to be a little bit smaller. Mm. Uh, so I think if you're looking, a lot of times people look at Apple ballot versus Post. I think the Post maybe. It's important to so notice the that difference? the Board of Education is not. Partisan. Democratic Republican. Right. right. What's right. the difference between the number of people that voted in the gubernatorial race versus the number that voted for Board of Election? Um, it was it was fewer because there were uh, over what, like I'm trying to remember now numbers uh, like 270 people who vote 70,000 people who voted in Montgomery County. Correct me if somebody knows it. But there was probably only like 180, 190,000 mm -hmm. who voted in the Board of Education. So there is a drop off. Right. Yeah. There is definitely a drop off, and people, you know, the Board of Education being nonpartisan is at the very end. So you vote for all of the mm -hmm. statewide offices. You're you know you're in Inside the state, your dele your delegates, your senator. Then you go through all the judges, the local stuff, and then the judges, and then finally you come down to the only thing after that is the constitutional mm -hmm. amendments. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people don't vote mm -hmm. if they really don't know anything. They didn't get far enough through the voters guide to get to that uh, those pages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where, where did the do? voters guide appear this year? It was yeah. in the beacon by, uh, by <laughs> some chance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, About thirty sure. seconds left. Yeah. yeah. In questions or comments you want to? Yeah, I think that it, it was. Um, I think that people respected, you know, the current board members, and that's why they returned. I think it is significant that Judy, who probably got, um, after Chris Barkley, probably got dinged the most, uh, not necessarily fairly, but dinged the most in the whole credit card thing, um, that she had the lowest margin. I mean, notwithstanding Chris Tribble's credentials, but I, yeah. I think that that probably played some role in it too. One thing that surprised me was there's no really talk about uh, the superintendent and the second term in the campaign, and that's a big issue. Well, I can tell you all kinds of stuff about that, but you'll have to have me back next month. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you heard producer Carlos Satensky on the show. She's got a secret to share with us, and she'll invite her back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jane. Stuart, always a pleasure to have you here. Thank it's you, the Don. first uh, uh, week of the month, and therefore it's time for the beacon. The November issue, yes. What's going on with it's it's open season for Medicare? Right. I'm going to start with Social Security. So start with Social Security. Lead in. Your, your um, show. The COLA for this coming year, 2015, is going to be 1.7 percent. It's got uh, disappoints a lot of people because it's not very much. But of course, inflation has been very modest, and the inflation, uh, the consumer price index that's used combines everything, including gasoline, which has gone down significantly mm -hmm. in price, and that brings everything down. Okay. So people are saying, well, it's only 1.7 percent increase. My costs have gone up a lot higher. The only good news, I guess, is that Medicare Part B premiums, okay. which get deducted out of your Social Security in most cases, are not going up at all next year. Some years, the Medicare increase more than outweighs the COLA increase. And here, at least you get to keep the COLA, okay. so for what it's worth. Okay. Uh, but um, I can talk uh, more about Medicare. No, I, I was thinking, so, so Social Security, so we got the COLA 1.7, and it's open season now, right? It's open Medicare. season for Medicare, yes. And it's very important if you have the Medicare Part D prescription drug plan. Every year, unfortunately, you really have to go through and decide who, who is the best insurer for your particular group of drugs. What happens if you don't do that? 
Well, if you stay with the one you've got, because, well, mm. I've been perfectly happy, it's been great this year, you might be really surprised, because this year so many of the plans are changing their formulary, what drugs they cover or don't cover. Mm. They're introducing new price tiers for costs of drugs. It used to be you could brand name or generic, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now it's preferred and non-preferred generic, preferred and non-preferred uh, brand name and specialty drugs. There are five different tiers in many cases. Can you explain mm -hmm. why there's so much confusion in this? It's why not we confusion, don't just it's, it's expense, it's cost. The insurers are trying to reduce their cost because more and more new drugs are coming out. They're more and more expensive. We can, we can save more and more people's lives with incredibly expensive medications and they don't want to cover it. I mean, it makes sense they from their perspective. They want to push everybody to, you know, the, the cheapest one, and it might be one that's already out in generic as opposed to something right. new that's still But it might not work for you in the right, same way. Exactly. So that as an individual, you have to talk to your doctor and say, can I use the generic version of this drug, or would I be sorry? And you have, Or try it out. You know, there are kinds of issues. There are some big uh, increases coming for some health care plans. I know that Montgomery County government is seeing a 7% increase in premiums next mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. and I think that's about average across the country for... Uh, health insurance premiums. Right. Well, we're not talking right now about all overall health insurance. We're just talking about mm -hmm. the prescription drug plans. Yes. And those, uh, in terms of the premiums people have to pay, the premiums aren't going up very much at all. That looks like it's pretty modest. But you have to look at the copays. You have to look at the deductibles. Right. You have to look at the, what the drugs are covered. I mean, there are a lot of other ways mm -hmm. in which they can make things more expensive for you, even though it mm -hmm. looks like mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. price isn't going up very much. And that's right. the, that's the issue. So you go to Medicare.gov. Uh -huh. You go to the plan finder. Right. You put in your, your your zip code so they know where you are, and then you put in all the drugs and the dosages you're currently taking, and it'll spit out for you all the plans that are available to you, and how much what drugs they will cover, and what your out-of-pocket cost will be for the year with what you're currently taking. Now, of course, your drugs may change, and all things may happen, but it'll give you a much better idea between plans because there's so mm -hmm. many variables. Mm -hmm. You really mm -hmm. have to use that computer to do it. You have to go to somebody who's got an internet and sit down and do it. Mm -hmm. Or you can call. I mean, you can call Medicare and work through it. I, I just think this is weird. More complicated than it has to be, mm -hmm. maybe so. Yeah, I, another another victim of, mm -hmm. of, of our health care reform gone well, but it was a Which very is, expensive program. This came program. in before health No, 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 no but, but in terms of we just haven't gone far enough. Yeah. I mean, oh, we're, um, it's still, it's still complicated. It's complicated it's for the wrong. Well, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there, there wasn't such a plan at all. I mean, no one had mm -hmm. coverage for drugs, so mm -hmm. it's a huge improvement over what we used to have, right. but it's still an issue. People all right, well, you're paying more for, for, for your drugs. You need to make some more money. Right. So tell us about how, they're gonna, how people are going to make a little bit more money than the financial world. Oh, okay. Those well, are financial news. Actually, we're talking more about how to how to not lose more money. Right. <laughs> that's, that's the best we can really do okay. here. Uh, we have two stories along those lines. One is the stock market's been doing phenomenally well mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. last few years. Really, it's a great run up. So the question is, is it time to you know cut your losses or cut your gate, take your gains and and get out? So we have a, a pros and cons. What kinds of things you might consider and think about mm -hmm. as to whatever stocks you have, what you should keep and not. Okay. And then bonds. A lot of older adults in particular are heavy into bonds, and that's mm -hmm. not a bad idea. You should allocate your portfolio between stocks and bonds. Uh, the question is, interest rates have been rock bottom sure. forever. <laughs> There's only oh, one way to go. The They're going to go up. When they go up, bonds values go down. So what do you do? So we have another article on what do you do with your bonds. And when mm -hmm. things start to happen, when interest rates start to go up, do you join the stampede to sell or do you wait until things calm down a bit? Because many times, once that starts, it really declines quickly. And if you jump in then, you'll be buying at the bottom, you know, or selling at the bottom. So high well, because it depends on, the, for bonds, it always depends. Do you already have them, or are you yes, are it, you buying you, them fresh? It might because be a good thing to buy Because if you already right. have bonds, mm -hmm. um, you want the price to go up. You want the interest rate to, to mm -hmm. be lower and uh, lower and lower. Lower, but you know yeah. interest rates going up, and interest right. rates go up no, though. No, I know the bond price. Right, so then you, that's a good time to buy the bonds that right. everybody else is selling. If, if so you don't right. have, yeah, if you don't have them. But All right, you've yeah. got more money in your pocket. Where are you going? We've got about two uh, seconds. Let's, let's do some traveling. Like we have a, a technology <laughs> section article on some tech tools that you can mm -hmm. take with you when you travel. Very useful, okay. interesting things. And then we have a great article on Carlsbad Caverns. I have never been, but now I want to go. It's hmm. really exciting. What did Will Rogers? Will Rogers call Carlsbad? He, Carlsbad? Yeah, Will Rogers called Carlsbad the Grand Canyon with the roof on top. It's the last word. Right. Roof on top for our show, actually. I want to thank you guys thank for, you. for thank joining you. me today. And I want to thank all of you in the viewing audience for joining us for this week's edition of Montgomery Week in Review. I'm Don Moore, inviting you to join us next week at this very same time.